Hey guys, this is your High Fist and welcome to Ruthenbad University. I'm here with the second lecture for our Quick Bend certification course, so please be seated for class. Unlike most classrooms, you're allowed to use your phone here, you're allowed to pass notes, you're allowed to get up to all kinds of uh, shenanigans you couldn't in school or college. In fact, considering that this is a Quick Bend certification course, you are actively encouraged to question authority and to question tradition, much like the subject of our syllabus himself. So we will be looking at just one scene today, guys, his first iconic introduction scene, which is ironically not iconic simply because of him, but also because it's the introduction scene of many key characters like Tattersail, Hairlock, and of course, the bridge burners as a unit. Most of our lectures will discuss multiple scenes, but once in a while, we will encounter certain quick bend scenes where there's so much going on and there's so much stuff to unpack that we might have to spend an entire lecture on them. And this is certainly one of those scenes, right? So Tattersail meets the bridge burners, Tattersail meets uh, the squad, right? So let's get into it. We start with a massive battlefield where the battle just got over. We haven't actually seen the fighting yet. That comes in a flashback in a couple of pages. We start instead by looking at the carnage first. There are dead bodies everywhere. And Tattersail is just standing alone on a hill overlooking the city of Pale that's just been conquered by the Malazans. This is her introductory scene as well. The, the sort of the descriptions of the scene are just so vintage Ericsson, right? The, the stench of burnt bodies is everywhere. There are countless ravens in the sky swooping down to eat the dead. We sort of, uh, what we do see it is that uh, an incredible exchange of sorcery has just taken place here with this battle that, that just got over. It was such a huge clash of magic that Tattersail thinks to herself, it was powerful enough to tear the fabric between worlds. That's how big this sort of cataclysmic battle was, that the warren of chaos itself felt close enough to touch. That's how destructive it was. I remember vividly, right, vividly remember reading this for the first time and thinking to myself, okay, even though chapter one was a bit confusing, this guy knows how to write a battle scene or a battlefield rather. And if he's even half as good at this, at describing an actual battle, then finishing these 10 books will not be a problem. Because if all else fails, I can still take refuge in the carnage of Ericsson's wars, if that makes sense. So this chapter, which is chapter 2 of Gardens of the Moon, it was an important early moment for me as a reader, because I had a much easier time following this than chapter 1, which just confused the shit out of me. And what this chapter told me was that even if everything else kind of goes down the drain, I will still be a fan of this guy's action scenes and battle scenes. Anyway, so back to the description of, of the battlefield itself. There's this great passage where there are piles of burnt armor just heaped on top of each other. There's no sign of the people who once wore the armor. They've just been vaporized by the sorcery. And there are survivors just walking around in a haze looking for their, in, in a daze rather, right, uh, looking for their friends. It's almost like the, the aftermath of some kind of nuclear blast. You really feel the gravity of what just happened, even though we haven't seen what just happened. As she's on the slope, she sees the Morant in their creepy insect-like uh, armor marching into the city below. And she knows that they're about to slaughter tens of thousands of innocent civilians. She's sick of the slaughter and she hates the Morant for kind of marching in to outright just butcher the civilians. But she also knows, knows that there's nothing she can do about it. The Malazans and the Morant have won. They are the victors. A three-year siege, we are told, has come to an end. And sort of the city has been smashed to pieces. And we get a sense of what just post-war, post-battle justice is like in this world. Just like in any other world, the victors get whatever they want. The hour of blood, right, is what she calls it. So she's just watching them from a hilltop. 
right? And she is like, oh my God, they're going to slaughter tens of thousands of civilians. And all of a sudden, she hears a voice next to her. The voice just says, they're coming. She turns around and she sees Herlock. And this is his introduction as well. His lower body has just been blown to smithereens and his entrails are just completely splattered out on the ground. She can see that he's using sorcery to keep himself alive, obviously, right? They have this interesting conversation and it's pretty obvious that they don't like each other because uh, she thinks he's a jerk, which he kind of is. And she says, not even Teshren can save you, Herlock. The, the damage done to your body is too much. Right? You can't be saved now. Not even a master magician, wizard like Teshren can save you now. And Herlock just laughs and says, Oh, look, you're so naive. Tattersail gets annoyed when he says that. And she's like, your guts are blown out. Your hatred for Teshren isn't enough to keep you alive. Right? So what exactly are you trying to do here by, by sort of using sorcery to maintain your last uh, life reserves? And he's like, look, you know me you know I always have a back door, right? That, that's apparently the type of guy Herlock is. And here, Tattersail makes a surprisingly vicious comment to Herlock. I guess she's just venting. She's like, back door, right? You, you can't even crawl right now, which is essentially mocking him for, for having his lower body blown away and not having legs. She's like, what back door? You can't even crawl at the moment. But he has a retort for this as well. He says, listen, that's part of the deal. The door comes to me. And as soon as he says this, Tattersail feels uneasy, right? Because she knows that something's about to go down. And over the horizon, the squad arrives. The legends arrive. Whiskey Jack, Quick Ben, Kalam, Sorry. She notes that they're all formidable looking, but it's Sorry and not Quick Ben who gives her the most alarm throughout the scene. We need to keep that in mind, right? At this point, we, of course, as the readers know that Sorry is possessed by Cotillion, so she's dangerous as hell. And while the others don't do kind of much about it, Whiskey Jack and some of the other squad members we find out are very apprehensive of Sorry, right? Uh, and uh, Quick Ben, we will see, is completely terrified of Sorry. He knows that something's up with her. So as soon as they arrive, Whiskey Jack looks at Tattersail and he's like, is this the person? And the tall, dark man riding behind him, none other than, uh, than Quick Ben himself, says, oh no, not her, not her, right? The one on the ground next to her. So clearly, these guys are a part of the deal that Herlock was talking about. And just as important in this dialogue is what transpired between Quick Ben and Whiskey Jack, because it makes it very clear that Whiskey Jack doesn't know much about the deal. He doesn't even know if the deal they've cut is with a man or a woman, whether it's Tattersail or Hairlock, he knows nothing. Whiskey Jack and Tattersail have a great conversation. You guys should read it because we can't really get into it in a quick bend lecture. She doesn't know they're the bridge burners at first, and then she realizes who they are. And of course, she's heard of Whiskey Jack, right? He's a legend, even though he's been demoted to sergeant now. She also hears in the conversation that they were in the tunnels, when the battle happened and that it was Teshren who had ordered them into the tunnels. So she thinks he's probably responsible for getting these guys destroyed as well. This is sort of when the intrigue now switches to Quick Ben. As Whiskey Jack and Tattersail speak, Quick Ben and Kalam make their way over to where Halak is and they sort of crouch on either side of him. And once Whiskey Jack and Tattersail have a conversation, he even turns around and he's like, Guys, what's going on here? Are we done? Come on, quick. And Whiskey Jack, I mean, uh, Quick Ben just smiles at Whiskey Jack and he says, just some last minute negotiations, right? Sorry. I thought that was hilarious and that encapsulates the Quick Ben character because here's this guy with his lower half blown away and his entrails all around him. Not even Teshren, the Imperial High Mage, can save him apparently. He's that badly hurt. We assume that these guys have come in here to heal him and help him. But they're busy haggling with him in the last minute instead for a few extra points, right? And even Tattersail's like, these guys are crazy. So Tattersail turns away and then we get the flashback into the Siege of Pale, which is, a, as you all know, a crazy, crazy 
battle sequence as one would expect right when a flying mountain is involved in a fight against an army and after the flashback is over it cuts back to where tatasalis at the present time and she sees that these guys are still crouched over herlock's body it looks like quick ben and whiskey jack have some tension between each other so not only did Qu uh, whiskey jack not know whom the deal was being cut with not only was whiskey jack not privy to whatever these last minute negotiations were it's now clear that whiskey jack is uncertain about the whole thing in general right he is just not on board this plan at all he is very very hesitant we have no idea what the deal is yet we have no idea what the thing is right but it's clear that he has reservations over whether it's the right thing to do quick ben has some rectangular thing in his hands that's wrapped up in hide so we as the reader and nobody there can actually see what it is he starts doing some magic shit as usual and there are these black designs and threads that start appearing over herlock's body and the hide bag that he has and stuff like that and even tatasail whom we've just seen from the flashback is a very competent and powerful mage even she is amazed she thinks to herself that quick ben's magical knowledge is even superior to hers i think she even says uh, he was her superior in the law right and we all know how knowledgeable tatasail herself is what amazes her even more is that he's using a warren she doesn't even recognize right here she is she's just gotten done with this big battle where the magical energy was so strong that even the fabric of the worlds was being torn apart and yet even she cannot recognize the warren that quick bends using she says it feels like denol but she also says he's he's twisted it in some way so we immediately know that this mage called quick ben is some kind of uh, magic magaiva right because denol is the warren of healing so she still assumes that these guys are here to heal and save herlock but it's quite clear from the body language of the rest that they are here for something else we still don't know what it is we might find out in subsequent scenes but right now what's interesting is that tatasail is still under the impression that they are here to heal uh the upper half of herlock's body and to save his life while the rest of them are quite clearly here for something else to make things even more intriguing herlock starts raving like a madman and he looks at quick ben and he says use her use her he points at tatasail and he's like use her after she realizes that uh, sort of she has a conversation with herlock and herlock places a few seeds of doubt in her mind that it was tashren who had cut him and kalot down and that the the sorcery that cut them both down came from the plains and not from moonspawn so she seems to agree that tashren was probably behind it and uh, she isn't sure about it right but herlock immediately once she has the doubt in her mind he's immediately like use her for whatever it is that they are planning and she's like guys what the fuck you know uh, use me for what right and there is no answer from any of them and when she asks herlock what's about to happen he just grins like a lunatic and he says what you are about to witness hasn't been done in a thousand years so not only is this quick ben guy using a warren that's unrecognizable to tatasail he is about to perform some kind of ritual using this warren that's far beyond anything she knows that's far beyond anything that even powerful mages know and with this we now start asking ourselves the same question she is asking herself which is who the fuck is this guy right how does he know all this who are these people as the ritual is being done she also notices kalam crouching on the other side of herlock and he's got this weird position where he's ready to strike with his daggers and ben even tells him to be ready before he starts this ritual so it's clear that the two of them are a team a great case in my opinion of showing and not telling we don't need the book or erickson to explicitly tell us that they've been friends for a long time and that they trust each other and that they are a team we just know that automatically from the way we visualize the scene so as i was saying there are these weird black threads and uh, 
uh, marks that appear on the height package and Hairlock's body. And then Hairlock just, uh, just exhales and dies. The entire thing ends as abruptly as it began. It's so abrupt that Tattersail thinks the ritual was a failure, right? She's like, oh, okay, so it failed, right? It failed. You guys tried to save him, but, but you couldn't. But Quick Ben just tells Kalam to hand over the package to her, the hide package that they have. She protests at first and she's like, whoa, I can't take this. What is this? I don't even know what it is. But these guys are like, listen, sorceress, we have no time for this, right? Just take it and go. Don't let Teshran find out. Just take this bag and go open it in your tent. Because at this point, she herself starts sharing some of Hairlock's suspicions that Teshren had betrayed them and had killed her lover. She kind of agrees, but as I was saying, she's not completely sure. She's kind of like Whiskey Jack in the sense that she doesn't seem too sure if this is the right thing to do. So Tattersail then walks away and here the point of view finally shifts to the bridge burners themselves. Quick Ben, as I was saying, is clearly terrified of sorry, which you might think makes him look less cool, but it actually doesn't. If anything, the fact that he knows something supernatural is up with sorry is itself testament to how sharp and perceptive he is. The others are completely creeped out by her as well. But he's the, he's the one who suspects that there's far more to her than that, that there's something supernatural involved. Whiskey Jack even scolds him a couple of times in the scene for being terrified of a 15-year-old girl. But he's like, no man, there's something really, really long with, uh, wrong with her, right? She scares the shit out of me. And Quick Ben always maintains that. Sorry, just uh, is scary in general. And it's worth noticing that she frightened Tattersail as well. So the two users who can actually sense magic were both terrified of sorry. There's this moment where Tattersail looks at all four of them and she's like, I can't decide who the most dangerous one is because come on, these are all heavy hitters, right? Whiskey Jack, Quick Ben, Kalam, sorry. But even she finally decides that sorry is the most troubling and the most sort of worrisome out of the four before her. So after Tattersail walks away, sorry then joins them and she's like, I felt you keeping me away, wizard. That wasn't a very nice thing to do to Quick Ben. So not only was this guy successfully pulling off some ancient ritual that's not been done in a thousand years, he managed to keep her, a God's direct agent, away from the scene as he was doing it. This is how skilled Quick Ben is at magic. Sorry talks to Whiskey Jack for a while and he then tells her to shut up and mind her own business. And it's clear that Whiskey Jack once again is going deeper and deeper into this conflict over whether what they just did was the right thing or not. And it's made clear even further that both Kalam and Quick Ben are in favor of revenge against Teshren and Whiskey Jack isn't. He's like, I need to think about this. Whiskey Jack also takes a step further and he says, look, we have new orders. We're supposed to be marching somewhere else and that's what we're going to do. And both Quigben and Kalam are like, you've got to be kidding us, right? After all this, after they've tried to kill us, you are still following their orders. You still intend to march where they ask us to march. They are they're clearly going to ask us to march to our deaths. But Whiskey Jack once again is like, listen, shut up. I'm the leader. I'm the boss. I'm daddy, right? So you guys take this creepy girl and get out of here, right? Because we are marching to whatever new destination I tell us to. Quick Ben doesn't like this, but he agrees nonetheless and leaves. And we're left with Whiskey Jack on the hill now. So that's an interesting parallel in the scene as well. It starts with Tattersail alone on the slope. And it then ends with Whiskey Jack alone on the same slope. And he thinks to himself that their next target is some legendary city called Darujistan. And he's like, a new nightmare is about to begin. And that's where the scene ends and then shifts to Tata Sale's perspective as she returns to the camp, blah, blah, blah. So in terms of the narrative itself, guys, that is the scene, right? Our first scene of Quick Ben, which also happens to be our first scene of many of the key characters. Now that we are done with the scene itself, let's look at some of Quick Ben's physical traits that we know of right now. So we know he's tall. We know he's lean. 
we know he's dark. Tattersale refers to him and Kalam as desert marauders, right? And they're both supposed to be from some place called Seven Cities. So Seven Cities is obviously some kind of desert land somewhere, right? Tattersale also notes how feminine his hands are, right? He has these long tapered feminine hands. I wonder if that's important. Maybe we should kind of take note of that for now. Erickson also says he has fine ascetic features, which I thought was a very interesting way to describe someone's face, right? Fine ascetic features. He also has white teeth, which is clearly a good thing, right? But he's, he's kind of, he has this flashing white grin, is what we are told. So these are all the physical characteristics we have about quick bend so far. And this is what we use for the mental picture, the visual picture that we have of him at this point in the story. In terms of his personality, we see that he's actually very loyal to Whiskey Jack. There's even a moment where he looks at Whiskey Jack for assurance that what they're doing is the right thing. Because even though he knows, even though he feels that they need revenge and that they need to pursue this for revenge, he still keeps looking at Whiskey Jack like, can't you just agree with me? Can't you just tell me that I'm right, that what we're doing is the right thing? And Whiskey Jack feels sad and bad that he can't give that to him because Whiskey Jack genuinely doesn't feel that what they're doing is the right thing. So there's, uh, there's clearly a respect that they have for each other. And these bridge burners are clearly a very tightly knit group. And as I was saying earlier, the bond with Kalam is sort of very apparent as well. As far as his abilities go, Erickson does a very interesting thing structurally. In the space of one chapter, in chapter two, he gives us a tremendous amount of information about how magic works as a tool in this world, particularly as a tool of warfare. And he uses both the Siege of Pale and the aftermath here to do that. We see how destructive magic can be when we see the battle itself. There's this amazing, spectacular imagery in the battle. We see demons ripping apart people, even powerful mages like Nightchill. We see the mage uh, Acronis, who's this fire mage, send out these huge pillars of fire that almost engulf this flying mountain they are fighting with, that almost engulfs the entirety of Moonspawn. And then someone responds with ice magic and he gets frozen and crushed. So even the powerful mages are getting defeated one by one by this flying mountain, right? This destructive flying mountain. And in the midst of all this, with all these Malazan high mages falling to Anamander Rake sorcery left and right, in the midst of all this is Teshren, right? Uh, this fucking guy whom everybody hates and yet you cannot deny the man's power. As sorcery rains down on him from this flying mountain, he is not only really deflecting it and scattering it everywhere, he also manages to keep shooting back magical blasts of his own. And there are entire cliff sides that break away from Moonspawn and keep falling off. And even Anamander Rake has no choice but to retreat from the brute force of Teshren's sorcery. That's how powerful Teshren is. And when it's done, the entire plane is destroyed. It's just completely wrecked. And there's Teshren alive by himself. This guy is on some kind of crazy level of power, right? And I think fans don't really give him credit as being one of the most powerful characters in the series. As a contrast to all this magical mayhem, as a contrast to all this discussion, uh, so destruction, sorry, we immediately see the covert, sneaky side of magic as well, because Quick Ben arrives, right? So this is not only the chapter where we see how destructive magic is, this is also the chapter where we see how much utility magic has, how much variety magic has. This is also the chapter where we get our first explanation of the warrants and how warrants can be used. I thought it was a nice touch from uh, uh, Erickson, right? To have Tattersale very briefly mention how it works. So to show us in the same chapter how warrants can be used both for outright cataclysmic destruction 
and for doing the quick bend type subversive shit i thought was really cool another little thing i want you guys to take note of from this chapter because we will encounter this repeatedly in the future is a phrase that tatasail uses when she looks at all the magical destruction from the battle she says always an even trade as we will continue with the series we will see that this is one of the foundations of the malazan magic system we also see just how dangerous the use of magic is because of this even though the series is extremely magic heavy it's always treated as a double edged sword because it's always an even trade i call your attention back to the first part of the video where tatasail says that the fabric of reality itself the fabric of the worlds itself was about to be torn apart by this massive use of magic so there's no there's no abracadabra i'm turning water into wine type stuff here right magic in all its forms is a very dangerous tool and you have to be really really careful when you're dealing with it and i want you to take note of that because it also explains why quick ben is such an interesting character and why he's such an important member of the bridge burners because he is the only one who treats magic like it's a toy to be played with he's the only one who's constantly innovating and doing all kinds of quick shit uh, sort of uh, quick shit and cool shit i guess right while even the most powerful wizards characters who are arguably more powerful than quick ben treat magic with so much more caution and so much more fear we'll we'll sort of discuss more on this when we look at some of the later scenes as well in perhaps some of the later books so in conclusion what are the major questions we have about quick bend right now what are we looking to decode as we move forward into the future the obvious question number 1 is who is this guy right he clearly has far more knowledge than any ordinary mage he clearly has the respect and trust of a legend whiskey jack and he's clearly trying to avoid attention as well so who is this master of magic who's now lying under cover question number 2 how did quick ben and hellock hook up if this ritual hasn't been done in a thousand years then how did hellock know quick ben could do it if all this was simply about revenge for what teshren had literally just done to them because the siege of pale just got over then why was the deal like this set up in advance before the siege of pale clearly whisky jack doesn't have a part in this deal it was orchestrated mostly by quick ben from the looks of it so did quick ben already know that they were going to be betrayed right or did hellock and quick ben make this deal after hellock was blasted to pieces if so how did they do that so that entire quick ben hellock deal i would say is question number 2 and finally we have question 3 which is what are they going to do about this possessed girl sorry whom quick ben is terrified of because we know that those two gods that we saw in the first chapter right i think amanus and uh, cotillion right or something were their names they seem to hate lessine and the reason they think lessine sort of uh, the reason they rather the reason they send sorry in chapter 1 as an infiltrator is because they say lassine would never suspect her so what is this grudge that these two gods supposedly have against lassine and now that the bridge burners seem to be turning against the empire as well are they going to be used as pawns by these two gods right so as we keep going on we can add more questions as they arise we can also erase questions as they are answered so for instance if we are filled in on the details of what this deal is between quick ben and hellock then we can erase question number 2 overall guys as an introduction scene for quick ben what we've discussed here is very tricky because as i mentioned earlier this scene is about so much more than just him if you go back and reread the scene which i encourage all of you to do it's about a whole host of characters and about the magic system and he's just one part of the overall puzzle in this because erickson is still introducing the world and the feel and the vibe to us so we don't really get as much of him as we want or at least as much as i want right 
we get a lot more about Tattersale, Whiskey Jack, uh, even Calot, uh, maybe Sorry, and stuff like that. And hopefully, as the story moves forward, we will start seeing more of him, where he's actually in his element, and we actually see him in action, right? Who is he? How does he know all this? What is he up to? Is he a normal human being who's knowledgeable enough to know spells that haven't been done in a thousand years? Or is he himself thousands of years old? We have no idea at this point. We have no answers. Hopefully, our lectures in the future will give us the answer to these questions since we will be going through every single quick bend scene. So, there you have it, guys. The second lecture of our certification course. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll see you soon at Ruthenbad University. Thank you and class dismissed.